is there gold in then our plays? Leslie. Leslie DeLeo is here to talk about America. Hi, everybody. Um, well, I have to say that the Yiddish theater is back. And America... Um, the land, the golden thank land. Thank you. America, the golden land, uh, a production of the Yiddish theater, is something that is playing, uh, has been playing at the Jewish Museum down at Battery Place, and it's the perfect location for this show. Same place where the Golden Bride played, and the shows are very different. They're into gold. <laughs> they're super into gold. And their shows are gold. Yeah, that's right. And I have to tell you, they are really, really national treasures because, um, you know, we did the review of the Golden Bride. This show is a little bit different. The Golden Bride is really um, a product, a musical production from that era. This particular show, um, the Golden Land traces the arrival of uh, Russian and European Jews starting from the late 1800s uh, to America. And so it talks about their, their leaving their homeland, coming to a new land, and then assimilating in the new land. And it's told through a series of um, musical episodes and highlights from people's lives. So you have the people coming from the old land. This, there are songs that cover every chapter in these people's lives from leaving the homeland, coming to the new country, going to the tenements, um, and all the individual moments that people experience, assimilating, moving uptown. Mm -hmm. um, so that's very interesting too. And then there actually are included actual performances from pieces from the Yiddish theater and then from the Jewish radio station, uh, which was very interesting to see an authentic Manischewitz commercial uh, and then a, a commercial for catering. Of course, in the 40s, these were all musical commercials. So, And, of course, uh, the people in the audience, you know, the minute they hear W-E-E-V-D, they hear the, the, the theme song, they immediately, like, it brings them back because people in the audience all remember this sort of thing. In fact, um, this is just a historical note, not part of the show, but the first actors' union was the Hebrew Union, actors' union in, in New York City. That's amazing. That's amazing. And that's something, too, I think that, I don't know, you may know this historically, but, but one of the things that happens in the show is the terrible Triangle Fire tragedy. And um, so that may in part have been something that contributed to the starting of that union. Maybe you know that. No, or no, certainly no, that, no, like no. That. what the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory started was uh, better things for the workers, for the, so with the workers. and child labor laws. Yes. And, and a, lot of good came, a lot of good came from that bad incident. And again, just you can't do a, a Yiddish-Jewish immigrant show without the triangle shirt oh absolutely because it was a seminal moment in, sure. in our lives in our lives and that's like the it, holocaust that's right Cert certainly in jewish but and also israel in, too and that's right the formation of israel that's exactly right as well as um you know all the immigrants uh, of people that the young women that had to work from a lot of the immigrant families mm -hmm. and, and and how did you like the you know the yiddish and all that i loved it i thought it was so expressive you're, you're not this is a non-jewish i'm very take, not very very non-jewish so you see it's good for jews and i'm a huge fan and i have to say one thing that i loved was when um when you see how the language how yiddish comes into the american language i loved it when the ladies the jewish women moved uptown and they started using the expression fancy schmancy, which I never knew where that came from. And um, of course, people say that all the time now. It was, I just l loved it. And it's, it's just a wonderful show. So even I went to see Marvin's Room, which is the Roundabout Theater Company's latest uh, installment at Broadway. And we thoroughly enjoyed it. We're gonna talk about it today. Um, I loved it. It was just wonderful, and I was I was talking with Leslie earlier about the things I liked about it. I feel like it's a story about moments. I know that it was done a number of years ago at Lincoln Center, I believe. No, I, it was done, but not Lincoln Center. It was downtown somewhere. I'm, I remember. I did see the original. Okay. Like, yeah, so it. I felt like there, you know, it talks about families and that the, there's one, uh, one of the two sisters, so it's about sibling rivalry, rivalry a rebellious teenage son, um, caretaking for parents as they age, things like that. And get sick. And get sick. And I, and I thought, and when I first left the theater, I, my first thought was for baby boomers, this reminded me kind of, of an our town, just kind of taking regular moments of the day or day in and day out and learning to appreciate them and recognizing the beauty of them. Even, you know, like I said, from the day-to-day -day things that these characters are experiencing. And then when things happen, which causes them to have to 
reconnect and and I think the two sisters have not seen each other in 10 years or so so I just I just loved it and I feel like again for my age group it it, it was wonderful yeah it's a, a very good family uh drama and uh we should say Scott McPherson who wrote Marvin's Room when he wrote this he was dying of AIDS and this was the only play he ever managed to get get out and that's what makes it doubly moving even though the play wasn't about it was more with with um leukemia and cancer and strokes and mm -hmm. and back problems and all all these other issues mm -hmm. but the main thing is how to deal with dying and living and you know like you say you know sibling rival you know mm -hmm. your you know family how to deal with your crazy family correct and how you change based on the circumstances and so, and I love that it, they, it was very, it, it could have been a very predictable play and the director could have made very predictable choices. But I found just as I was thinking one thing, then they then something that I wasn't thinking would happen and I love that, whether it was with the costumes and um, when they and went the to set. Disney World. The set was fabulous. The, the set, I love the set because it had just this very faint image of a palm tree because it takes place in Florida. Mm -hmm. And you're kind of like, am I imagining things? Correct. Or, it was very cleverly done. Mm -hmm. And we should say the cast, which is Janine Garofalo, Lily mm -hmm. Taylor, Celia Weston, Jack DeFalca, Karen La Civita, and all, Trini Sandoval. Mm -hmm. I mean, there was this uh, directed by Ann Kaufman, who usually is a downtown person, and, <laughs> and Trini Saldivar. As a, you think he's an incompetent doctor, but he, he's not. I mean, that's again something you 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 think he's one yeah, way, but he's really not. And it's just really just was I just, so. I thought it was I'm fantastic. So glad, I'm so glad they brought this play back, especially now. You know, mm -hmm. where we're, we're now the new thing is everyone's getting cancer, and it's you know. And also, you 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 know you just lost your mother, right, right. and we're seeing this. So I was kind of worried about you, but it, you, it was it was great. That it was a good it was it was fantastic. So if you're in, like in dealing with grief or anything, mm -hmm. this is a good play. And at Roundabouts, Laura Pels is Megan Kennedy's Napoli Brooklyn, which is and it's 1960. As we follow a dysfunctional Italian family. Nick is the overbearing, abusive papa who makes life hell for his wife and three daughters. Everything comes to a head when an historical event occurs that I had never heard of. I don't want to spoil it, but do be warned, it involves a blinding flash of light and extremely loud noise. This was one of the best casts with not a false note amongst them. They were so totally believable in character and choices that I was totally drawn into their world. Much more on Facebook, but go see this, but be careful. Potomac Theatre Company is back at Atlantic Stage 2 with Howard Barker's Pity and History, directed by Roman Richard Romagnoli. And it's set in the time of Cromwell, where um, they're revolting against the monarchy, destroying churches, destroying the art in the church. And the main guy is the artist who doesn't mind so much destruction. He realizes life changes, but he wants to be paid and fed. And it's sort of mixing contemporary and 17th century. Very clear, very smart, very intelligent. One of the better Barker plays that I've seen. So I would give this an absolute happy face. So Running and Rep with Penny and History is Tom Stoppard's Arcadia, which is my favorite Tom Stoppard play. And talk about blending past and future. We start off at this wonderful English uh, a country house in the 18th century? Yeah, early 18th century. And early 19th century. 19th century. All right. And they're, what they're doing is they're, they're changing their classical garden to romantic garden. So it's classicism versus romanticism. And then we cut to late 20th century where there, there are these people trying to research this garden and, and trying, one guy is trying to find out if Byron was there and the other one is just trying to figure out about, you know, the garden and everything. Right. Who was the hermit in the hermitage? But what makes it so cool is we get to see what's going on in the past and they're trying to figure out the past so we know what's going on and they don't and so we can put the pieces of puzzle better together than they can so it's funny to watch them all stumbling around and I just find this so moving and it's very much about what gets lost and what gets remembered and the most interesting character for me is the very young girl Thomasina who's a mathematical genius way beyond her time 
and you know like her stuff is just forgotten about and now all of modern math is sort of based on what she discovered by herself and it's sort of like she wants to marry Byron, but the towards the end when she's getting a little older, she yeah, don't give too much okay. away. But she gets much fonder of her tutor. Well, you gave it away. Oh, it's not a big giveaway. It's it's a wonderful play, and it's um, really one of the best I think of the twentieth century. It's just okay. lovely how it. Lear de Bassano is directing Shakespeare's A Midsummer's Night Dream in the free Shakespeare in the Park where fairy magic wreaks havoc and lovers in the wood. And this was so brilliantly cast because you have the short Hermia, Selena Grant against the tall Helena Annalie Ashford. And Lysander Kyle Beltran and Demetrius Alex Hernandez are chasing after the females and being chased after by them. And Oberon Richard Poe, King of the Fairies, is after Felicia Rich shots to Tanya to get a changeling boy and he elicits his his person Christine Nielsen Puck who makes all this nonsense occur. Meanwhile the trade people are putting on th Pyramus and Thisbe with Danny burst in his bottom who's turned into an ass. Quince Robert Joy, Flute Jeff Hiller who is this very tall Thisbe and very funny and there's this great singer Marcel Davis Lashley who sings between scenes in Clint Ramos's gorgeous costume David Rockwell's beautiful Sylvan set and this is just the best Midsummer I've ever seen so go see it. In Tina House Singing Beach at Here, directed by Ari Laura Creeth, a family prepares to put Grandpa into a nursing home as a massive hurricane approaches. The granddaughter embarks on a voyage of the imagination to keep Grandpa with her. The stress is driving a wedge between the novelist mom and, her ac and the academic stepdad, Owen, and there's also a brother who is like the star athlete of the family while the little girl is kind of a bit neglected but she lives in her imagination which is really vivid and I think it's exciting what she imagines but it doesn't quite work especially in this production but I enjoyed it even though it was a very flawed play. Yeah, um, Theater 167, I love this company. They usually do these very meandering, magical New York stories. So they're set in Massachusetts. So that's a departure, literally a departure mm -hmm. for them. And this is escapism in a different way. And it does have a WTF ending, which kind of spoiled it for us. But in the meantime, it was fun to watch this unfolding. And Tina Howe loves language. Yes. I mean, uh, bees, beeswax, mind your beeswax. I mean, no kid says mind your beeswax. But it sounds lyrical coming out of the way the characters, even though it makes no yeah, sense. Yeah, even though it has a lot of problems, I really recommend it for its experimentation, originality, and heart. So I gave it a mixed, but I think it's a play with possibilities. Happy Face Minus, I think, more for me. My sister Lynn Heineman and I saw War Paint back in April, and I'm going to give you my sister's review, and you can read my review on the Facebook page. There's a new Broadway musical based on a work of nonfiction using immigrants as protagonists, and it's not Hamilton. It's a theatrical evening without a hint of a romance, and there's an obsessive feud without an actual confrontation. Moving from 1935 to 1964, War Paint presents the parallel lives of Elizabeth Arden, portrayed by Christine Ebersole, and Helena Rubinstein, portrayed by Patti Lapone, as they built their cosmetic empires in a world where they each face sexism and Rubinstein's case anti-Semitism. Doug Wright's book dramatizes the rivalry between the cosmetic queens who never uttered the other's name as they created, marketed, and peddled their products in a business world dominated by men. The score by Scott Frankel Music and Michael Corey lyrics heightens the ambition and ultimate loneliness of these entrepreneurs of emollients. It's both melodic and literate, using true rhymes and clever wordplay, referencing Epidermis Rex in song titled Dinosaurs. The interchangeable men in their lives, and yes, each did change teens mid-career, are Arden's husband, John Dawson, and Rubenstein's gay assistant, Douglas Sills. Both the women are the showpieces, 
but the show left me with a definite no need for repair happy face and we both give this a happy face i agree with her this was just splendid Bob Creaso saw Afterglow, written and directed by S. Asher Gelman at the Davenport Theater. There's more on Facebook. But this concerns um, a married gay couple who invite a third person in for a threesome. And the idea, can this work as a triangle or is there always two, one too many people? Uh, the situation is complicated here by the fact that the married couple are having a baby while the third person is convinced that he's found the love of his life in one of the guys. Uh, Bob found this rich, realistic material well acted and cleverly staged with all the three characters exposing their private parts as much as their vulnerabilities. <laughs> um, but he felt we don't really know who and what these people are outside the triangle. The play is too long. But the guts of the play has a lot of potential, but the writing doesn't break through to find the gold there. So he gave it a mix. Encores Off Center recently had, which is now closed, Kristen Child's The Bubbly Black Girl Sheds Her Chameleon Skin. But coming up next, as it's going on right now this weekend, is Really Rosy Carol King and Morris Sendak's musical. Now, The Bubbly Black Girl Sheds Her Chameleon Skin, Nikki M. James plays uh, Bubbly Vivica, but everyone calls her Bubbly because she's always smiling and cheerful and happy and she just loves her little white chatty Kathy doll. It's not a chatty Kathy, it's a chatty, chitty chatty doll. And the chitty chatty, you know, when she pulls a string, it pulls her strings like, oh, the best thing in the world is to be white and because that's the way to be successful and she wants to be a dancer and she blows off her childhood boyfriend because she has dreams of going to New York and Hollywood and everything else. It's just so delicious and delightful and I can't wait to see Really Rosie and I'm giving it Encores Off Center a happy face because they're wonderful. From old musicals to new musicals, New York Music Festival is going on. These are all closed, but you can see the reviews on my Facebook page. Night Tide is about a mermaid. Cadover, the, the Cadover Sonat is about this pope that was dug up and put on trial. King is this high concept musical about the city, with the city as one of the characters. Fourth Messenger is about this female Buddha, Gouda, played by Nancy Anderson. Numbers Nerd is about a, ma a female math team. A Wall Apart is Air Supply, talking about the Berlin Wall and lovers being parted. Generation Me is a teen suicide musical that's actually really good. Uh, Gory All String Band is about this real female Texas prisoners who put together a string band to get pardoned. Uh, Play Like a Winner is Soccer Moms. And I Am, I Will, I Do is just, you know, relationship problems and financial problems. Anyway, most of the things, I've only saw two things I didn't like, which was A Wall of Party King. But the rest is all good, and there's still more musicals going on that I haven't seen yet, and you can still see too. So I'm looking forward to whatever Nymph has to offer. And now for a musical treat for you. Joe Levy with Mark McKee singing Take a Shot, her new wonderful single. Hi, I'm Joe Levy, and this is Mark McKee, and uh, we're going to be doing a song called Take a Shot.
country-ish as well. Kind of has that country vibe, so that's kind of where I got the, the influence for that. But I also love James Taylor, Bonnie Ray, Susan so I grew up kind of listening to that, that country vibe feel, and so yeah, very country. How did you come up with this gorgeous song, Take a Shot? Um, actually, when I was about, actually when I met my, boy, my boyfriend right now, so uh, I met him at a bar, and one thing led to another, and that was my boyfriend, like 10 months. But it also was like a play on words, you know, if you're going to take a shot, take a shot on me, but then talking about like James and Fireball, like all the different whiskeys, uh, whiskeys like my fave, so that's where Take a Shot is inspired from. Oh! I doing pop music, and uh, kind of just along the lines, really got into the country vibe and the country pop right now, and uh, my producer Mark and I got in the studio, and we're like, let's see what happens if we write a country track, and... We did, and it's, it's, it's pretty awesome. I'm loving it, so it's been... Pop is all about the beat, and country's about the emotion. Is, I mean, am I right? No, yeah, I mean, you're definitely, definitely right in, in, both, in both senses, but um, there's a lot of country music that's, that's very, uh, let's go, let's have a good time, let's party, let's, like, you know, go to the lake or drink some beer, uh, bonfire, you know, all that kind of stuff. Family, lots of family-oriented... Uh, Right. right now we just have to take a shot and we're working on, our, working on producing our second song and when that comes out, it'll be awesome as well. Is there some place people can download it or stream yeah, it or something? Yeah. Um, uh, Spotify, iTunes, SoundCloud, uh, YouTube, uh, my Instagram uh, is Joe Living Music, J-O-L-I-V-I Music, uh, for everything, Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, Twitter. So yeah, check it out there. Uh, everything's up there right now. Take a shot just went live a couple days ago on Spotify and iTunes. So, Ooh, check it out. so everyone should take a shot at you. They should. Take a shot on me. Thank you. Thank you. And now here's an interview I had in November with Gary Morgenstein and Jordan Auslander. Here they're talking about Mad Mel Saves the Universe. But they got Saving Stan at Broadway Bound, and the entire interview you can find on our Facebook page and YouTube. They are two very entertaining fellows. Hi, I'm Jordan Auslander, and I'm with aspiring writer, author, aspiring, what am I, who am I kidding myself? This guy's got a track record. Introduce yourself, Gary. Gary Morgenstein, I'm the author of Mad Mel and the Meridians, which began as a stage play back in 2011. This was my idea. I tried to think of the danger of a writer's imagination and couple that with political commentary, not confined just to Earth, but throughout the Milky Way galaxy. So I made up a play, wrote a play, um, about a writer who says that he's creating, he's creating a cottage industry of all these books about the ancient aliens, the Meridians, who apparently once were on Earth. But he thought he made them up. The problem is they actually existed, and he interfered with their invasion plans to conquer Earth and to bring it as part of the Meridian um, Empire. And this brilliant actor here, Mr. Auslander, played Flem. And actually, I wrote the, the role with him in mind, and he didn't screw it up too badly. He got a, he got a Best Supporting Actor nomination at the festival when, the, when we went up in New York City. What festival was that? That was the Midtown International Theater Festival. Thank you for reminding me, sir. And the Midtown International Fringe Fest Theater Festival is still going on until August 6th. And Afterglow has been extended to September 16th. Crusade of Carno Stevens is now closing on August 6th. Really, Rosie, the encore is off center. Nymph is going on to August 6th. New festival, Broadway Bound Festival. And there you can see Jordan and Gary in Saving Stand August 7th. And the Summer Fest Festival uh, has Sex Jokes and Murder Jenny Yasko's show, which should be wonderful. She's such a talented, talented writer. See the new cast in A Doll's House Part 2. And see two of the most wonderful entertainers in war paint. My gosh, Christine Episode and Patty Lapone can't get better than that. And August 6th Indecent closes. Catch it before it goes. Some great cabaret places. And free theater. Come on, this is the summer. You don't want to miss the free theater. Take advantage of all the free theater that is out there. Roundabout's got two good shows in that Poly Brooklyn, Brooklyn and Marvin's 
Room, Jerry's Girl at York Theatre Company, Musicals in Mufti. Oh my gosh, with an amazing cast. Check it out. And 59 is 59. A Real Boy is a puppet show. And Summer Shorts has the best writers contributing to short plays. And if you get a chance, guys, go to the Berkshire Theater Group. They're doing Music Man. And they are so spectacular and do such a fabulous job. And Pipeline and Suitcase Under the Bed is upcoming. All these reviews will eventually end up on the Facebook page. And the entire interview with us, with Gary and Jordan, are on the Facebook page. And they are so funny. And these are the parody production recommendations that are going on right now. Don't forget to pick up your performing arts inside of the cultural heartbeat of New York City. Our next show is August 19th. And go to Facebook.